pitchers are starting to pitch around him. Yes, sir, there she goes. It's another series win for the Toronto Blue Jays. They come away with a very close 3-2 to two win today over the Boston Red Sox and a 2-1 to one series win. Uh, lots of good starting pitching. Lots of stuff happening in this three-game set. This is episode 193 of Section 138. I'm your host, Mark Colley. As always, joined by Bryson and Jacob. How are you guys? You mentioned it, Mark. I'm doing very well. The starting pitching, which was the issue, I guess, throughout the first couple of weeks, the concern. Three games at Fenway Park. You know the way it can get at Fenway Park. Overall, I'd say it was pretty damn good. And I think it was highlighted today by Kevin Gosman. Eight innings, so close to doing a complete game shutout. So close to getting that done. But all in general, just a great week for them, obviously. And then the Jays found ways to win in Boston. Can't complain whatsoever. Jacob, how are you? You talked about, uh, you know, how it can get at Fenway. I'll tell you what. Call it a series win all you want. It it felt like you just won, like, the division series. Because this started off, it was a very quiet game. Kevin Gosman doing his thing. Offense providing, you know, a little bit of help. But, man, that ninth inning, that final inning of the game, of the series, really made it feel like a playoff game. And I, if this is how the rest of the season is going to be, I, I couldn't be in for a, a better ride. And we got more against Boston. <laughs> this is not the final game. They're coming up. Obviously, the Blue Jays heading to Houston for a three-game set, but then they got a four-game set back at home at the Rogers Center against Boston. And then, thankfully, they steer clear of the Red Sox for a couple months at least. The next time they see him is going to be towards the end of July. But, yeah, what a series it was. And, I mean, the starting pitching is a story of this series. We knew that the first week of the season was going to be a little bit rough from that perspective. Guys not fully built up, guys not fully prepared. But I think what we're seeing now is what we more expected from the Blue Jays starting rotation. You have Yusei Kikuchi giving you about as good a start as you can hope for from Yusei Kikuchi in the series opener on Tuesday. He goes five innings, three hits, one earned run, three walks, three strikeouts. The big thing for Kikuchi was that he started a lot of batters off with a ball instead of a strike. I think it was just nine of like 21 or 22 plate appearances were started with a strike. So that's something that you obviously need to improve. And in some regards, he got lucky just being charged with one earned run against the Boston Red Sox. But again, this is a Blue Jays fifth starter, I guess fourth now that you have Ross Stripling in the, in the rotation. So what a start from him. And then you go, to Wednesday, you have Jose Brios on the mound looking to build off of a strong start last time out, and he does exactly that. Six innings, one earned run, gives up eight hits, so is able to work around some stuff, but strikes out six batters. Good start from him. Again, starting to build momentum, starting to improve off a rough start to the season. And then Kevin Gosman today, there are no words to describe what he did. There's no way to describe the performance that he just put on eight innings, eight innings plus facing one batter in the ninth inning. If he doesn't give up that hit to Trevor story, maybe we see the blue Jays first complete game shutout since 2015. It's been that la- that long. It was Mark Burley in 2015 who had the last nine inning complete game shutout for the Toronto blue Jays. And it looked like we almost saw it today. And even if he didn't finish it off, What a phenomenal start from Kevin Gosman, and how encouraging is this for the Toronto Blue Jays to have the rotation be clicking, and even if the offense isn't totally going yet, you got the starting pitching that's right there and uh, firing on all cylinders. I'll tell you what, the thing that's a little bit even more impressive is the Red Sox are a good team, or at least expected to be a good team. Now, yes, they didn't have J.D. Martinez in this third game, but this is a good team. This isn't no disrespect to them, but this isn't Oakland. This isn't the Rangers who, yeah, they might have some, some good hitters, but are not overly good teams altogether. Like through three games against a AL East team. And the majority of the AL East is fantastic. You have three runs charged, three earned runs charged to your starting pitchers. And yes, that, that base runner that was given up by uh, Kevin Gosman today, that was charged to him, despite it was Romano that was pitching Still, three three runs charged to your starting pitchers after what we saw this first little bit of the season. I think this is an absolute win for this team. And what's more impressive is Kevin Gosman. We know he was ridiculous all game. Like I don't. I, we all debated whether he's going to come out in the eighth or come out in the ninth in the eighth, and really to, all throughout the later ports, portions of the game. But 
He was fantastic all throughout the game. You say Kikuchi and Jose Brios, I'm a little bit even more impressed with, and I'll tell you why. The two of them struggled in different ways. Kikuchi command was there somewhat, getting behind batters. Jose Brios had hard hit contact all throughout the game. I think his first four of his first five batters gave up, he gave up hard contact to. And despite that, he was still able to limit the Red Sox to one run. And if this is what you're getting, if, if I wouldn't say that the, the first two starts were peak Brios or peak Kikuchi, but if mediocre of those two guys gets you that, I think this team is in for a very long uh, and very exciting season. And the key to baseball, you got to have good starting pitching. You got to have good pitching regardless, but offense, especially when the offense isn't necessarily there, only one run. Uh, Zach Collins continues to hit well in the first game with that home run. Offense was definitely there in that second game, but still, regardless, not a ton of offense throughout the entire series, yet the pitching was able to carry them. And bullpen's been good all season long, but when you have now starting pitching, do what's it what it's expected to do. I, honestly, you cannot complain. And for all the people that said, well, Robbie Ray should be back on this team. I said this, I called him, I called Kevin Gosman the replacement to Robbie Ray. I think that he's even better than Robbie Ray at this point. And it's early in the season, yes. But when you're able to dominate really two good opponents, you've, you know, the Yankees were good or are good, not as good of a start, but, you know, a good start against them, good start against the Red Sox, another good start or looking to have a good start against the Red Sox in the next game, which is his, uh, his next scheduled start. But if you're able to get this, then honestly, I think this is the starting rotation that could take you very deep into the playoffs. And yes, it's early. We'll see how things go against the, against the Astros. I know they have a weekend series in Houston, which from recent memory, I don't think is a very kind place for the Blue Jays to play. There's been quite a few series losses there, but still very, very good starting pitching. And you, you really can't ask for anything else. Like when your offense is not doing well, when the bullpen has been a little bit overworked in the early portions of the season to get pitching like this, Charlie Montoyo couldn't have asked for anything better. And now when you think about it, Romano was your only reliever. He threw a lot of pitches in today's game, but he was the only reliever used today. And the entire bullpen, I would say is fresh going into the series against Houston. They did just call up Taylor Saucedo. So even more fresh arms going into that series, but it, when you're able to limit the Red Sox, a good Red Sox lineup to this many runs throughout an entire series, I think you have to take that as a win, and we'll see how this can continue. And hopefully the bats with, I mean, Hernandez, I still think a couple games or a couple weeks away, but we'll see what the bats can do. Hopefully the bats can heat up. And then from that perspective, if the bats heat up, you have a rotation like this, easily could be one of the most complete teams in the American League. I'll tell you one thing. The Yusei Kikuchi experience is probably equivalent to a roller coaster. I mean, we saw what happened in New York. Wasn't the greatest. We saw what happened this week. You guys kind of uh, bled it off a little bit with that one. Two walks out of the gate uh, at Fenway Park, and it just it felt like it was going to be one, another one of those days. But he was working through it. He was grinding through the lineup. Um, as much as he was getting uh, the a lot of hard kick, uh, sorry, hard hit contact, or at least uh, a few during a few at-bats early on, he was getting a lot of ground balls and that was really crucial. And I think the main difference from what we saw, and this is something that we well, or we knew coming into this year, or I should say throughout the spring after he signed, we saw about or kind of his season last year. You look at what happened with him in Seattle, the all-star first half of the season, the fall off in the second half of the season, it just seems like he completely got lost. And the Jays are kind of, obviously the goal with that was to bring him in and try and work him back towards that uh, in the first half of the season. And Charlie Montoyo said it prior to the start. He's a work in progress. He still kind of is a work in progress. He didn't get a lot of time to get familiar with everybody. He kind of came in on a short spring training. We know this. And the one main thing or the, the takeaway that pretty much came, I think from Pete Walker himself, I don't know if he told the media this or if it was just well known throughout the team is that one of the ways that they were going to try and get him back on track was to limit the use of his slider. Um, or it was his cutter. One of those secondary pitches increased the use of the fastball, and we saw the results pay out. If you go back to a start against New York on April 12th when they lost 4 nothing, so that was his first start of the year, he used his fastball and slider about the same amount of times. Uh, 27 times he used his fastball, 25 times he used his slider, and that was pretty much equal use, and the Yankees weren't exactly being fooled by that. We know how that went. I think he went three and two-thirds. You look at his start this past week, or I should say a couple days ago, 51 times used as fastball, only 18 times as slider, only 17 times as cutter. 
He was pretty much using his four seam fastball majority of the time topped out at 97 miles per hour. He was getting a lot of swings, even on his four seam fastball, and he looked a lot more in control. So clearly what the Jays are trying to do with Yusei Kikuchi, it worked uh, this past weekend. It's something that they're going to try and get to or try to continue and make improvements on. I think he threw his fastball. It was like 56 or 57 percent of the time. I believe Pete Walker said that they want to get it to around 60. That was the goal. And we know that he's still a work in progress. What interests me with Kikuchi is what we see uh, about him, I guess, this weekend in Houston, a team he's very familiar with, obviously previously being with the Seattle Mariners in the same division, even throughout the first half of the season he had last year in terms of dominating um, in his first half, he didn't exactly dominate the Astros. He He had trouble with the Astros even in the first half. And of course, in the second half, when the rails already fell off, we, he also had trouble with that. So despite all of that, what we saw, um, you know, him battle a little bit early on, it did finish off to be a really good start. And he had a lot of things going on. He worked out a lot of, he worked out of a lot of trouble. Bichette had one of the, that error that he worked around or worked out of the first time it was his first error. And it really paid off to be good. And for you, Jose Barrios, we know pretty much the only thing about what his struggles have been has been the command. The velocity has never pretty much stopped. It has never dipped. And it's been something they've been working at. It just looked, again, kind of similar to Kikuchi's first inning. A little bit shaky, a little bit of hard hit contact. But he he managed to pretty much pitch from the stretch the entire outing. And he managed to get out of trouble every single time. That is what you need from Jose Barrios. We know he's going to be a lot more sharp than that, of course. But what I'm saying is he was working through that lineup. He was battling and he was avoiding trouble. And you can't complain about his performance whatsoever at all. And of course, um, the only flaw I think we saw from Brios was a lot of the base hits he gave up, which is why he was pitching from the stretch majority of the outing. And today, I mean, there's not really much to say about today other than just pure domination from Kevin Gosman. I mean, his stuff was filthy. And compared to what we saw from Brios and Kikuchi earlier on in the series, Gosman was attacking that strike zone right away. First pitch strikes. You see how effective that was. Look at the efficiency. He was at, I think, six innings at 60 pitches, seven innings at 70 pitches, you don't see that anymore. You really don't. The only time you see that is when you're playing MLB the show and you're going against rookie mode and swinging at every single pitch. Cause you know, it's going to be a strike. You don't see a low pitch count like that anymore. His velocity was up there. Um, and I, I pretty much his, everything was on point, even a slider, which is, I think is his third most used pitch. Everything was really on point, getting pretty much equal whiffs, equal swings. But of course the dominant, the dominate or dominant pitch today was that four seam fastball again today. So overall, It was very promising. This was very promising. This is what you needed to see. We spoke about this. Mark, you pointed out, so I'll give you the, or I'll give you that shout out on this one. You said it without Hunjin Ryu. What are we going to get out of Yusei Kikuchi? That could be the difference maker besides what we see from Ross Stripling. We know Stripling. We know what we're going to get out of him. We know he's going to eat innings from Ryu. But one of the main factors for this rotation to be okay moving forward is what we're seeing from Yusei Kikuchi. We know we're we know Barrios is going to be okay. We saw that a couple of days ago as proof. We know Gosman's going to be Kevin Gosman. We know Alec Manoa is going to be Alec Manoa and continue to pitch well. That deciding factor may be Yusei Kikuchi. And if you're a Blue Jays fan watching that outing this week against the Red Sox and moving forward, you like what you see and you got to have optimism moving forward. Still a work in progress for sure, but you just like the direction things headed for this rotation throughout these um, three games in Boston. The offense still working their way through some issues. Obviously the blow up game or when they got most of the runs was the second game with Brios on the mound. They got ahead really early. They're working through that. So right now the starting rotation is definitely helping them out as they work through this. And you know, it's a matter of time before both of the offense and the, the pitching clicks at the same time. Yeah. And I mean, like we can nitpick all we want. Like obviously the Brios and the Kikuchi starts weren't perfect. And if you have that same start nine times out of 10 or the same numbers, like the eight hits, the six hits, the three walks, that kind of thing. If you have those outings nine times out of 10, it's going to end up with more than one run. You're probably going to end up in a situation where you're giving up three runs. But again, even that five innings, three runs for you say Kikuchi, if we had that, every single week from him i i'm gonna you know at the end of this three-year contract i'd offer him another three-year contract for 36 million dollars like that's exactly what you need from this guy he is performing what the blue jays expected from him from a fourth slash fifth starter and basically all the performances this weekend was exactly what we expect jose brios is not the ace of this rotation he is the reliable day in day out guy who's always going to give give you the same thing i know jacob you think 
he is better than Kevin Gosman. I disagree. Kevin Gosman is the ace of this rotation. Jose Barrios' job is to eat innings, not be an elite guy, but be a very good guy. Not an all-star, but a notch below that. And what we saw this series from Kikuchi, from Barrios, and from Gosman was exactly what each of them are. So in that regard, you have to be happy. And just to use one stat, 27 innings pitched in this series. The starters pitched 19 innings and gave up three runs in the entire series. One run each for Kikuchi, for Barrios, and for Gosman. You could not draw it up any better. And if this is what we're going to get when they head to Houston and when they come back to Toronto to face the Red Sox at the Rogers Center and then Houston at the Rogers Center, man, it's going to be fun to watch. But like we said, the offense, kind of in the same position we were in a little bit ago last time we talked, things bounced back a little bit. In today's game, you kind of expected them to have a rough day. Tanner Houck on the mound, incredible pitcher. He's they mentioned on the broadcast has never given up more than three runs in a start, three earned runs in a start. So kind of expected what the Blue Jays did today, putting up three runs, not much clicking against the, the Red Sox bullpen, but it turned out to be enough. Yesterday was a big game with Brios on the mound. The Blue Jays score five runs in the second inning, partly thanks to Ramiel Tapia, two-run bomb. Um, and that was their biggest offensive showing in a week. Um, so that was a big turnaround game for them. And I think, like we've said it before, I don't know how much new there is to add here. We're not really concerned long-term for this offense. It's just a matter of time. And hopefully what we saw yesterday on Saturday, um, or excuse me, on Wednesday in that game with Jose Brios on the mound and the Blue Jays scoring six runs, hopefully that's indicative of a turnaround and, and the start of a turning point for this offense. Oh, absolutely. And still, Teoscar Hernandez has not played since, uh, what was it, the the New York series. So he's missed roughly a week. I think it was actually a week um, week today or a week yesterday on Wednesday. But So he's obviously out. Danny Jansen, not the biggest offensive piece in this lineup, but he's not been here. Alejandro Kirk's been pretty quiet. Uh, Matt Chapman started off quiet. He's definitely creeping up there. He's doing a lot better. He had three hits today. I'm going to call it two because – one of the hits it was he was credited with a hit but it was a pop-up that was dropped but still which is a hit yeah no yeah like i'm called like it was a good at bat like definitely get on base do do whatever you need you're not here to hit 50 home runs or 30 take it but if he's able to do that that's absolutely great but yeah and and the pop-up to be fair to the red sox had a expected batting average of zero like point zero 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 so yeah it's we can call it a hit but yeah, that's fair. No, yeah, but like still three hits today, three hits and four at bats. You only had one in five in the previous game and then uh, one hit and four at bats. But still, like he had a double today. I'll take that. He had uh, he was credited with an RBI still like he, I, he actually had two. So two strikeouts in this entire series for a guy that strikes out quite a bit. I'd still or at least has has had times struck out quite a quite a bit. I'll I'll take that. But still like the offense. It's going to get better. And George Springer only had two at bats, I believe it was today. He didn't start, but he came in, pitched it for Biggio, two strikeouts. The offense will get better. Like it, I know we keep saying that, and eventually it does need to get better if you want to win, but it will. Like it, it's I don't think this is necessarily a thing to be concerned about. And at least they're winning. Like if they this was a pretty low scoring series for the Blue Jays overall, except for that one game uh yesterday. If you're able to win these games you can build off of that. Whereas last season they would, they'd lose those close games. A lot of those close games. And really, I mean, except for one game, this entire season, Jordan Romano has been part of that game. He's been closing. So that obviously helps him, but still like my point is, is you're winning these low scoring games. A win's a win. Like you can go behind the scenes and look to improve all you want. And there definitely are improvements, but you're winning. This improves your record. And you get like, what I'm trying to get at here is it's not like, at the end of the season we'll look back and say oh well they weren't hitting well in april and that's why they ended up missing the playoffs by a couple games like they're not hitting well but they're still winning and so it's it's concerning ish but it's not concerning to the point where i'd be trying to find other options because they're still getting the job done in whatever way possible and like i said earlier if you can still win with a pitcher doing as well as they do today and starting rotation looks like it's getting back to form or getting two form really because the season's just started bullpen's been good all season. 
it's a very complete team and I'm not uh, I'm not worried I think is the best way to put it yeah um we know this they're working through it I think game one was obviously the worst one offensively they were like 0 for 5 with runners in scoring position the only run came from another Zach Collins home run so shout out to him he continues his hot streak and look at today he was batting cleanup so you know I think the one takeaway though I had with today's lineup and a lot of people were talking about it early on was thank goodness George Springer's okay because you see the flaws in the lineup without him. Um, we know it's not ideal because of how slow of a start they got off to. So thank God, or by the looks of it, we were saved from a George Springer IL stint, knock on wood, because he came in today. That's good news. We know how cautious they can be with George Springer. So that was pretty much the only thing from that, I guess, offensively that game. The second game we know right away, I really like the at-bats as much as Tapia um, hit that home run. I really like the at-bats from Espinal and Kirk there. They got uh, both walks, back-to-back walks, and of course the sack fly, uh, moved them over from George Springer, and then Bichette drove in two right after that. So Bo Bichette. And Kirk, Kirk overall, he had two um, opposite field opposite, pitches as well. Yep. Kirk is working through it, which is really good. And so the, you see kind of, you can see it slowly starting to turn. Even I think Vladdy looked a lot more comfortable today. We've been talking, there's been a lot of talk about him chasing a lot, but you can make the argument about the strike zone he's been going against. It's kind of hard to really have an understanding of where you're at. We know George Springer wasn't in the lineup today. We know Teoscar Hernandez, their usual cleanup hitter is not there. He's not as protective as, or protective as he was, or sorry, protected in the lineup as he was beforehand. So there's been a lot to talk with that, but I thought he looked really comfortable today. Bo Bichette's been a topic this entire series. You guys know exactly pretty much what I'm referring to from game one. I guess I can ask you guys what you feel about that defensively, but I'll say offensively, he's also starting to work through it too. He got a couple of hits that game. And uh, today he had a couple of good hits today too. So not too worried with that. I guess today too, a main takeaway, I will say pretty much what got one of the um, pretty much the first runs of the game going was the bottom of the order. I mean, uh, Gosuke Koto came off in his MLB first MLB start. We know he's kind of appeared off the bench a few times, lead off walk two run inning, uh, Boba Shett singled Vladdy had a sack fly. So I really like today, the bottom of the order kind of got things going for the first runs of the game, but overall, I mean, we know this. I told you guys last series or when we spoke last series too. I mean, I thought Chapman had a really good series. You see it turning this series too. So you see guys slowly turning that corner, even though Vladdy's never really been too much in a huge rut. It's just the fact that he's had a lot of home runs, but he's been striking out a lot. He's been chasing a lot today. He looked a lot more comfortable today. A lot of these guys are putting up better at bats. The runners in scoring position still isn't there, but they were two for eight in game two and game three. So they're making strides and they're getting there, which is pretty encouraging to see in my opinion, especially the lineup they had out today, not exactly what you had predicted going into the season was Zach Collins hitting fourth with all due respect to him or guys like Rymel Tapia leading off for this team. So hopefully Springer's in tomorrow night. I'm sure he will be. I think he spoke about it today. Both times, I think last year and going into this year, he's been injured the series before Houston, which has been pretty disappointing for him. So he made it pretty much it well known today. He wants to get in the games uh, throughout the weekend. I think he'll be fine. Good news. He showed up today. And it's only a matter of time before all these guys start to gel at the same time, but you can definitely start to see some signs of life uh, in terms of the at-bats that they're putting up. They're definitely putting up a lot better at-bats than they were previously. I'm glad you brought up Vladdy because that's someone that I want to talk about. Um, Prior to this series, he had two walks on the season. He walked on April 10th in the final game of the three-game set against Texas. And then he also walked on April 15th, the first game of the Oakland series. In this series, or on on Wednesday alone, he had three walks. He also walked on Tuesday. Don't believe he walked today. To me, it's kind of getting to the point, with this indicates, obviously, it's small sample size, that kind of thing, but pitchers are starting to pitch around him. And whether that's a good thing or bad thing for the Blue Jays remains to be seen. I look at it as kind of a bad thing because I think Vladdy adds more to this team when he's swinging the bat and when he's hitting, you know, 48 home runs in a season and putting up an OPS plus of 180, whatever it was. Obviously not a bad thing to be taking walks and Vladdy can't really control what pitchers do, but I'm kind of bummed out that we've gotten to the point where pitchers are deciding just to issue him a free pass instead of trying to challenge him with the pitch. And we saw this a little bit with Tanner Houck. Tanner Houck did not want to throw Vladdy anything down the middle of the plate. And obviously you don't want to throw any player 
uh, a ball down the middle of the plate. But Vladdy specifically, you could tell he was steering clear, trying to nibble at the edges a little bit instead of really fully committing. And still, Vladdy was able to do something today. He hit that sack fly, got the RBI. Um, I'm disappointed that pitchers have figured it out and aren't pitching to him. And I hope it changes. I hope this was just kind of a one-day thing, a one-series approach from the Red Sox and other teams don't clue in as well because – I want to see him swing the bat. It's always exciting when he gets going and gets a hold of one and takes it, you know, 15 rows back into the bleachers. But um, hopefully this is not indicative of a full season trend. And hopefully we still get to see Vladdy doing crazy things with his bat. One thing I do want to point out going into yesterday's game. So Wednesday, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. has the highest, or I should say the lowest strike percentage out of anybody in the league his what I mean by that is the amount of pitches that are in the strike zone for him to like actually hit lowest in the league I think it was around the 35 ish percent or 39 like so basically uh, like he's only getting two-thirds of the pitches to him where he could actually hit hit them and yeah you, you only need one I guess to hit a home run but still out of everybody in the majors he is receiving the least amount of hittable pitches i guess you can call them and it's i mean i i wouldn't be surprised about it and i'm not really surprised about it it you don't necessarily want to give a power hitter that or probably one of the best hitters in the game today a pitch to hit but it's it's definitely not surprising and the one thing that i hope or at least gives me hope that's not going to be a full season trend is Teoscar Hernandez is obviously not playing today and, or didn't play at all this series. And so no disrespect to guys like Zach Collins or Lourdes Gurriel Jr. I think he hit fourth or fifth uh, in yesterday's game. I, I would feel less comfortable not pitching to Vladdy if Teoscar Hernandez is behind him because he can hit 35 home runs as well. And you're not going to, not pitch to Vladdy and, and say, well, I'll take my chances with Hernandez because he's probably going to take you deep if you do that anyway. So I don't think it's necessarily a full season trend. And obviously I feel like this is kind of obvious, but I'll just mention it. Pitchers sometimes miss and sometimes you'll get that pitch that's supposed to break, but doesn't break or just completely out of the strike or out of, uh, or the pitcher loses control and it's not exactly where it's supposed to be. So I'm not overly concerned. I know it's definitely going to make it harder for Vladdy to hit because he's obviously not getting those pitches to hit, but give it some time, give it, give it time for Hernandez to come back, give it time for the rest of the offense to come and really do things. Because, you know, like we said, Bichette's just barely coming back uh, and going to, I guess, mid season form, if you'll call it Springer hasn't been bad, I wouldn't say, but you know, again, you're waiting for the rest of the lineup to get things going. At that point, it's not like you can afford to not pitch to Vladdy because you have five or six or seven other guys that can not do what Vladdy does, but you don't want to pitch to prime Matt Chapman or prime Teoscar Hernandez, if if that makes sense. So hopefully it doesn't continue. Also, you know, the Blue Jays are facing good teams right now. They face the Red Sox. They're going to face the Astros and then the Red Sox again. And I think the Yankees after that or something like that, like it's a lot of good teams. And so when you start to face the not so good teams or, especially as I should mention, when you face teams in Canada, when certain guys aren't able to play, maybe it gets a little bit easier, but I'm not really going to bank on that. But my point is, this is probably the byproduct of being one of the best hitters in baseball. Those pitchers are not going to give you those pitches to hit, especially now that they've seen you for how many years has it been? Two, the equivalent of like two full seasons almost at this point. So I'm not surprised by this. I still think Vladdy will adjust, you know, when he gets his pitch, like look at Josh Donaldson back in 2015. I think Buck Martinez mentioned this and it always stuck with me. He said, you just need one pitch to hit and yeah, you can miss that pitch and still do well throughout the rest of the at bat. But you look for one pitch, you get it in your spot and he can easily hit it out or at least do damage in the way Vladdy does. So I'm, I'm not worried. I would like to see him not walk because I think he, he can do, like walking is definitely beneficial for the team, but he can do more in other situations if given that opportunity. But still, I would consider this a, a productive series for him. And if he's able to get on base, he's able to do what the team needs. It's it's not a concern. And I think the home runs and the, the average and all those things will continue to uh, climb as the season goes. Yeah, just to make it clear, I'm not knocking Vladdy at all for his performance this series. It's not his fault that he's not getting pitches in the zone. But yeah, I mean, the protection part of it is a big aspect. But yeah, Brayson, go ahead. 
Yeah, no, I just think the protection definitely has a big impact. There's a few things. I mentioned even the strike zone with Jeff Nelson, that game. We all know the famous game. And even in this series, I thought there was one call, either game one or game two, where he struck out looking at the top of the zone and he kind of put his, his hands up in frustration. I just think it's hard for someone like him and there's no fault again from what you were saying, and it goes for anybody. It's hard for, or I should say him in particular, because we all know how good of a player he is. People are going to approach him differently. It's just hard to get a read of the zone. Like there was calls that he never got getting all confused, kind of getting all messed up. And I think that's got him a little bit anxious. I was talking about it uh, earlier, his chase rates up, everything about that is up and strikeouts are also up. But at the same time, the walking still there, his OPS is still over a thousand. So, you know, Pitchers have adjusted to him. I think it's pretty obvious. And I would make the argument pitchers have kind of adjusted everybody uh, on this lineup. They're kind of recognizing of how good and dangerous this lineup is. And um, I do think it'll be, eventually Vladdy will definitely adjust back because we all know how good of a player he is. And I'm sure there's going to be a time where he figures everything out. So I think there's a lot of factors going into it. The protection is a huge one. I mean, you haven't had Teoscar and Andes all year. Um, and that's talking about after Vladdy. So maybe you guys are willing to more, you know, I would say challenge him a little bit more because of that. And there's not a lot of, you know, you, you know, you have guys like Guriel after who doesn't usually hit cleanup Zach Collins today. So you can see the hole there. And then the other argument I'll make is ahead of Vladdy. You have George Springer, you have Bo Bichette. Springer had a kind of a good first few games. And then I think since then he's cooled off a little bit, but he's still been relatively good. Bo Bichette's off to a rough start. It's, you know, kind of different or it's exactly not ideal every game where you're you're having your first plate appearance and uh, you'll you have two strikes against you right away so I think that's also a factor and um, you guys were talking about it today one of you said about the sack fly and you guys were talking about I think it was Jacob talking about pitchers missing um, that was a that sack fly that Vladdy hit that was a miss pitch um, uh, the approach this year to Vladdy has been outside in a way kind of Today or that in, uh, that pitch in particular went inside and he was so close to hitting a three run home run off of that. So examples like that, you're going to see, you can hear him kind of screaming in frustration about that. That was a pitch to hit. He's going to get pitches hit across the way. And it is disappointing to see because you're used to Vladdy kind of always hitting home runs and all that. So it'll get to a point where I think he does eventually adjust back, which is going to be good, but there's just, there's a lot of factors going in right now with that. So I just, you know, the, he's hitting the ball well, or when he does make contact, he's still getting hard hits. It's just, again, the chasing rate, everything about that is through the roof right now. He's going to settle down. He's going to make adjustments along the way, which is good. And, um, you know, just everything about that, I think, is encouraging. So we saw it today. He had a really good opposite field double, too, in the, in the uh, right center gap today. So that was really um, good to see from there as well. So Vladimir Guerrero Jr., I think he will f kind of figure it out. But just this is an, an adjustment that I think teams are making to everybody. So it's interesting. It's a kind of a first for Vladdy because we know he had a first cut in a slow couple of years last year. He really took thing or took off. And um, this year people are really being careful about that. So the other thing too, I'll say, and I don't know if about you guys said, cause I don't think we've really spoken about this too much in depth and we know the injury to Hernandez, it, the lineup isn't as deep. And I think that's very obvious. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Apparently does not like hitting second. I don't know if you guys think maybe if the struggles continue or if there's any kind of a point where Charlie makes a change, would you guys, are you guys cool with Vladdy hitting second? Like, what do you guys think of that? Just because of how the lineup isn't exactly showing, you know, it's not as deep as it was before. And we know Vladdy, as much as you get the extra at bats hitting second, we know that he's more comfortable hitting third. It's pretty much well known. So that's always kind of an option. I think I've always kind of had in my mind and I'm sure everyone, a lot of people have had that saying, you know, the lineup overall still, I guess, if you want to include every game, still hasn't been producing to their standards. Do you change it up a bit? I don't know. I, I don't know what you guys think about that, but that's always kind of been a discussion. And um, I think for now, clearly they're going to keep rolling with the usual Springer one, Bichette two, Vladdy three. Change it up all you want. You don't move Vladdy ever, <laughs> in my opinion. Like that is full stop something that you never do. Because, like you said, Vladdy likes hitting third. And when you have someone as good as Vladimir Guerrero Jr. in the lineup, if he likes hitting there, you don't touch him. <laughs> Period. Full stop. And I think going back to, I, I think it was 2019, or maybe it was parts of 2020, he hit a little bit out of the second spot. I'm looking at his splits career-wise. Batting second, he's played 66 games from that position. 
which is the most that he's played besides batting third, where he's played 183 games out of the three hole. Um, he doesn't have bad numbers. Like this is Vladimir Guerrero Jr. We're talking about out of the, the two hole. He's batting 260 uh, on base percentage of 333, slugging of 438, OPS of 771. It's not bad numbers, but when you have someone as good as Vladimir Guerrero Jr., you don't move him from where he's comfortable, period. Full stop, no exceptions. So, yeah, maybe they need to reject the lineup. I mean, we saw them getting a little bit creative today with Springer getting the day on the bench after getting hit with the pitch and Collins batting fourth, Tapia up at the leadoff spot. You got Coteau making his major league debut. We saw them getting creative a little bit in this series. And even before today, we saw them making a couple of interesting decisions. Vladdy was DHing, so they had to decide who was behind the plate. They chose to go with Kirk. People were upset that Collins wasn't playing, given how hot he's been. They've had to make these decisions, and they've been playing with the lineup a little bit. But in my mind, full stop, you can't move Vladdy if that's where he wants to play. I, You walk up to him, Charlie Montoyo asks, are you okay moving out of the three spot? He says no. That's the end of the conversation. You do not move him if that's where he wants to play. I'm going to put it this way. I'm not, I, I don't think that they ever should move him. And I don't think it's likely unless it's deemed a necessity by the team, or at least some type of experimentation is deemed necessary. Like if you're, if the team's not performing well, the offense is just completely dead over a week or more span, or maybe a series or two or something like that, especially Vladdy, if he's kind of off to a, a bit of a slump, I think you entertain the option, but I still don't think that it would necessarily happen because now I don't want, I don't want to make it sound like this, but I don't think, I don't think any player would necessarily get mad if he got moved. Like, I know this is a different situation, but Springer has already said that he doesn't care if he gets moved to, to, uh, to right field as like a defensive replacement. If Zimmer comes in, I'm not saying that Vladdy would necessarily get mad if he got moved or offended if he was asked to switch positions in the lineup, but I, if he feels the most comfortable in this spot and he's as good as he is, I don't really think that there's much of a, of a need to move him. And the only way that I could see that work is maybe you put Guerrero third, Hernandez four, Bichette five. Cause I don't think you put Bo Bichette as your, as your fourth hitter. I think that would have to be Teoscar Hernandez, especially if Guerrero's hitting uh, or excuse me, your three hitter, if Guerrero's hitting second, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's, it's not happening at all, or it should never happen. I just, that's the type of thing where like if you if you have a binder of like all your ideas this is in your your folder of like panic button type situations where if the team is not doing well at all then you entertain it but as of right now even if he's what is his stats aren't even awful this this season still on base percentage 377 like he's getting on base average is uh it's been over 300 pretty much for the entire season he's not going to get moved unless unless it's absolutely necessary to jumpstart this lineup or, or kickstart any part of this team. So I'm not saying it's not going to happen, not saying it won't ever happen, but I highly doubt it. I don't even think this solves anything though. Like to me, it's not the problem. Like Vladdy is, you say his numbers aren't awful. His numbers are amazing this season. Like maybe it's not the MVP caliber season we saw last year so far, but he's hitting what? 302? <laughs> like mm -hmm. he has got four or five home runs um he's you know on base of what you just said 377 like Vladdy's not a problem if he's comfortable in the three spot you don't move him and like yeah like maybe you enter the conversation of other people aren't comfortable where they're hitting maybe that's when you get into the conversation of shifting things around but even then I don't think that solves a problem this is game 12 we're on heading into game 13 like people short in spring training they aren't hot yet they're starting to figure it out we've seen some guys start going it's not the time to even entertain the conversation of dramatically shifting things maybe you can play with it on the margins but like right now it's not even i don't even think the blue jays should be talking about it i think one thing i just want to say the only i'm not saying it would solve anything i just think the only time you could entertain it is when you need like a fresh start at something else. Now we see that oftentimes where guys go to a different team and they're better. I know that's not a, the same situation, but maybe if moving, you know, obviously we see Tapia at the start of the lineup at the, the leadoff spot. If it's something like that, where it's like, maybe we'll see what that does, but yeah, it's not like 
if the if the Blue Jays are over 500 and they're playing even relatively well, you don't change them. It's only if like your season's in jeopardy and you just need absolutely anything to to try and kickstart them. Yeah, the one thing I I think to contradict you on that one or a little bit is that I think Kevin Barker said this and it's a really good point is you don't want to do this and alert your clubhouse and show panic because then, you know, a lot of people look around and you just don't want to do that. You don't want to show signs of that at all. The team has potential. We know the potential this team has. So I think there's obviously talk. I think Mark, you said it a couple of weeks ago that you prefer Bichette hitting cleanup. I don't, I think that was you that said that. So there's always a possibility on that, but does Bo Bichette even want to move down? I don't know, but clearly what we've seen so far um, is they're going to stick to it, which is good. They're going to continue to be flexible with the lineup. I will say this today in pregame, Zach Collins was practicing at first base and it appears that he's going to get some first base time uh, in the next few days, maybe the next series in Houston. We see it just another example of how they're going to try and keep things flexible. You know, the guy that's usually been playing first base if Vladdy's been DHing has been Kevin Biggio. So maybe that diminishes his role a little bit, a little bit more, even though he's getting a lot of reps in the outfield right now, because especially today with Springer and um, Te Oscar being out. So just proves that Zach Collins is getting more opportunities to be, stay in the lineup now on days where Vladdy will DH. So it'll be interesting to see on that. But you can see, um, you know, as much as they're not moving or making any significant changes in the order, they are being very creative with the lineup and they have no choice right now because of all the names that you don't have that you usually have. So Toppy has been the guy that's been leading off. If it hasn't been Springer, I think Toppy let off the day Springer had that off day. So really that's been the only guy that's really been known to lead off this year. So uh, it just appears that was kind of a one game thing, but even last year, I know uh, Mark, you were going over some splits last year. Vladdy had 18 games at second. Wasn't relatively the greatest either for him. I think OPS of 740. So I agree with you on that one. Conversation stops uh, after he says, no, I'm hitting third. I want to hit third. We're going to be okay with this lineup. I just think it's always entertaining and kind of interesting debating or having conversations about any significant changes to the order that would maybe jumpstart anything. And how do you do it without showing panic in your clubhouse? Because that's the last thing you want to do with the expectations this team has. And they're far from that right now. I mean, the best part about this is they're eight and five and you wouldn't even know it if you didn't even watch any of the games, the way people react and freak out on social media, it's like they're zero and eight or zero and 10. So I love it. I love the conversation. I love the expectations this year, first place in the AL East and the team still hasn't even gelled together at the same time yet. That's scary as much as they've been going through ups and downs throughout different parts of the team and they're eight and five. Last thing I'll say on the lineup, I think for the most part, lineup changes are a bunch of hogwash. It's a bunch of black magic and, you know, dark magic that does not make a difference at all. Um, most of the time, like, obviously there are situations where it does change things and guys like hitting certain places like Vladdy and, and like I said, Bo, I think the four spot fits him better. But I think if you're looking for a fix in the offense and your first solution is to move guys around in the lineup, that's when you know things have gone south. So hopefully the Blue Jays aren't in that position. I don't think they are. I don't think they'll ever be this season. I think they understand that they're above that, that there's other stuff to change and that the lineup positioning is almost 100% of the time not the problem. Um, let's talk about some of the other stuff that happened this week. Um, it seems like the vaccination status of players entering Canada is – just something that does not go away. Um, we were talking about this before the season started. At that point, I thought this conversation would be our, over. I thought it'd be a thing that we talk about once and we're done with, but it seems like every new media market that the Blue Jays go to, it becomes a talking point. And it's something that the big guys, the big players, whether it's Bob Nightingale, whether it's John Heyman, whether it's Jeff Passan, they will not let go. And it continues to be a talking point. It was a talking point today in this series. Tanner Houck saying that he is unvaccinated and will not be making the trip to Toronto the next time the Blue Jays play the Red Sox next week. Um, we also heard that the Yankees, the players that were unvaccinated on the New York Yankees, have now gotten vaccinated in time to make the trip to Toronto when they come up next, which I believe is going to be the very start of May, May 2nd through 4 is the next series for the Yankees in Toronto. So to wrap it all up, this week, Rob Longley of the Toronto Sun had a quote from Charlie Montoyo that was 
quite vivid in its detail about how much the Blue Jays care about this vaccination issues. Charlie Montoyo said, quote, rules are rules, and that's why we couldn't play in Toronto for two years. And from experience, nobody gives a shit. Nobody cared about us when we were in, in Dunedin. Um, and I think that pretty much sums up how every Blue Jay fan feels right now. Nobody cared about it when the Blue Jays were playing in Dunedin. Nobody cared about it but when the Blue Jays were barnstorming across Dunedin, Buffalo, and Toronto in 2021. No other team cared. The Blue Jays sucked it up. We sucked it up at fans. We understood it was a fact of life, given the situation with the pandemic and how these two countries are handling the pandemic differently. Um, we sucked it up, and now other teams got to suck it up as well. And to be honest, it's not really an advantage for the Blue Jays. At the same time as teams are losing players when they travel to Toronto, the Blue Jays had to trade away players or decide not to sign players because they were unvaccinated you know to speculate a little bit here a lot of people said Stephen Matz unvaccinated we don't know if that's true I I think it may have been confirmed at some point I don't know speculation unvaccinated I believe it was confirmed yeah Blue Jays didn't sign it they instead began with Yusei Kikuchi who knows if Matz is vaccinated Maybe this ends up a different way. Maybe they actually preferred to sign Mats, but they couldn't because he was unvaccinated. And of course, he would miss 82 games of the season, 81 games of the season playing in Toronto. So all this being said, I think other teams just got to suck it up. <laughs> you know, this is something the Blue Jays dealt with for so long. Now you're going to have to deal with it. And obviously it hurt the Blue Jays so much more than it's hurting these other teams missing like two players in a three game series compared to the Blue Jays who played outside of their home ballpark for 120 games. So that's how I feel about it. Suck it up or just get vaccinated. Like <laughs> listen to the science and, you know, suck it up and get a vaccine. You know what I think irritates me a little bit more. And I'm, I didn't have necessarily enough time because this was years ago. I think it was maybe even like the start of last season, but I swear the New York Yankees or somebody in that organization during a series in Dunedin complained about it and said like this is not a major league uh environment or something like that and it's like well okay what do you want like you want us to go play in toronto Th this isn't it's not mark it's not charlie montoya or mark shapiro's fault that players cannot go and play in toronto like that's a that's a government issue that's a you know i don't want to get too far into the whole vaccination stuff but like this is not the blue jays fault and in fact they're at more of a disadvantage you mentioned guys they can't sign if God forbid one of their key players, like say George Springer, I'm just, I'm not saying he's not vaccinated or whatever. I'm just saying, say you have a key player who's here for a long time. Say he couldn't play half the season. You got to trade him or something like the blue Jays are at a, the just to, just to bring up a real world example. There was speculation that Bo Bichette wasn't vaccinated until I think last season. Uh, Cause he had had COVID at one point and there was, whole conversation about that but that's like a real world example where someone on the blue jays key part of the blue jays may not have been vaccinated and could have cost them yeah exactly like th say what you want about you can't have tanner Houck make the start next week or i think it was there were some players some key players for the yankees that kind of dodged vaccination questions earlier aaron in judge. the spring exactly yeah i didn't want to but yeah aaron judge like key key players they're gonna miss a couple games bo bichette or any of these players they would have missed half the season and Blue Jays are at the biggest disadvantage here. And yes, technically it's a choice to get vaccinated. I'm not going to say that it isn't, but like at some point other teams have to realize that, yeah, this is, these are the ramifications and it's not the Blue Jays fault. I think it's, it's fair to say that it's, it's more of a disadvantage to have the Blue Jays in Dunedin so that, you know, or Buffalo or anywhere else than it is to have them in here in, or have other players missing, missing games. Like it's just, the complaining from the rest of the league, it just baffles me because like you said, like we've all said, like everybody else is, you know, all these big reporters, nobody cared when the Blue Jays were missing games. Nobody cared when I think it was both the Pirates and the Orioles said they couldn't use uh, their home park to play games. I, and Blue Jays sucked it up. Like they lived out of suitcases. They had, you know, guys like Hyunjin Ryu without his family for, for, uh, was it like two seasons or a season and a half? Or even when we talked to Dan Shulman over a year ago, he said that like 
he would have had to leave his family for six months if he were to go and travel with the team. Like there were, there were so many people within the Blue Jays and their broadcast and their organization that are negatively impacted or were negatively impacted by this. And nobody cared. Like Blue Jays are in Toronto. They're going to stay in Toronto unless there's like a seventh wave and border restrictions and all those things come back. But Blue Jays are here. They're staying here. If the rest of the league doesn't like it, I'm sure there's a vaccination clinic that is near them. Yeah, I'm not going to comment too much on this, but uh, the one thing I think is kind of forgotten about uh, from the Blue Jay standpoint is they have the exact same rules. You got to be, everyone's got to be vaccinated in order to enter the United States. So I think that's the part that is very, I guess it's not misled. It's just for some reason, it's not brought up and it's not spoken about. It's just spoken about the fact of this is only going into Canada. They don't, and that's the problem with, you know, a media in the United States. They don't, it's for just some reason, it feels like they put Canada on a different sort of like different Island. Like it's just, you know, the way it can be with Canadian att- or I should just say Canadian content in the United States. So that's pretty much the main thing about this is the Jays have to do the exact same thing. It's just for some reason it's not really brought up. And I think that's probably kind of the most ironic part. And yeah, as much as it, it is a competitive or I, it's not even because the Jays have the exact same rules. They have the disadvantage of letting guys go. Mark, you were talking about it. There was even rumors about the Robbie Ray situation. We don't know. It's all speculation. I brought up Michael Conforto to you a couple of weeks ago as a potential option. When you got you and Jacob were having your discussion. Maybe that's not even on the table because of that. So there's things that the Jays have had to comply with too. We don't even need to get into the different ballparks they've been through for the past couple of years because we know what a roller coaster and what a ride that was. And pretty much everything Charlie Montoyo said was absolutely true. I mean, I didn't see this amount of attention when the Jays weren't allowed to play here. It just felt like this was kind of buried from American media and uh, it just all of a sudden happened. And then they kind of reported it once the Jays eventually got clearance. No one really cared about the Jays conditions, you know, the risks of being denied to play in Pittsburgh, the threat of being denied to play in Baltimore, the fact that they had to renovate Buffalo within two weeks, the fact that they had to move from a stadium with a hundred people basically to Buffalo again and play home games against the Red Sox and the Yankees, but make it feel like it was away games because you were playing in New York. And then the same thing back in Dunedin when you had Tampa Bay Rays fans. And it's even more concerning when Tampa Bay Rays fans are outnumbering you just see I'm the rabbit hole I'm going down here. And I didn't see any stories about it. I only saw it pretty much people that were at the park that were covering this team saying pretty one-sided here. I mean, there's a lot of Red Sox. There's a lot of Yankees fans here. And um, that is a competitive disadvantage, if you ask me. So we'll see. I personally do not care either. Um, You know, Tanner Houck, you guys said, made the announcement. There's going to be other people that are going to make the announcement or kind of just who go on the restricted list. You saw Kirby Sneed, one of the Oakland A's that weren't allowed to come to Canada last week. That was one of the guys that was traded for Matt Chapman. Now, for wondering, I guess people at the time wondering why Kirby Sneed. I don't think a lot of people were asking why, but when it comes down to it, There you go. Um, So there's a lot going on behind the scenes that we do not know that the Jays really have to deal with in terms of having challenges ahead of them. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, that's an afterthought for me, Jacob, you were saying how, you know, guys miss three games or whatnot, and it's not the biggest deal compared to guys in Toronto. Well, the only argument I'll make back is people like the Red Sox and the Yankees who got to play here 10 times a year, kind of a little bit of a different story. If you're, you know, if you're a team in the AL East compared to a team like the Oakland A's who come here once a year. So we know the rules. Rules are rules. And uh, I think Charlie pretty much nailed it on the head right there with that one. Two things I want to bring up as well in this conversation. Number one is the U.S. has the exact same requirements for entering. If you are entering the U.S. by plane, you must, and you're not a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, you must be fully vaccinated. And yet people are placing Canada in this entirely different conversation. U.S. has the exact same requirement. Um, And then the second thing is New York City almost had the exact same requirement this year. It was a conversation before the season started of whether Aaron Judge would be able to play home games at Yankee Stadium because they required that athletes be fully vaccinated. And this was a conversation that came up with Zachary Irving of yeah, the he Nets. missed games. Kyrie Irving yeah, missed, missed pretty missed much the entire like year. Half their season, yeah, because he wasn't vaccinated. And now people are, it seems in baseball, this entire conversation is 
aimed at the Blue Jays and really not even Canada. It's focused on the Blue Jays as if it's that organization's fault. I, I don't understand it. It gets me riled up. One more thing too. We see how, and obviously you look at it and you can kind of understand what they're doing, but you see teams and the Blue Jays sort of kind of working around this too now in terms of testing i'm not I'm talking about vaccination status we were talking about it a couple of days ago it appeared the jays went to buffalo they drove to buffalo or bus down of buffalo to fly out from buffalo the oakland a's did the same thing it appears that it's going to be kind of something that american teams do when they're coming in as well as the jays so you know teams are working around this too and i just look at it from the point of um you know the team is really at fault from your decision. And that's why, you know, those teams kind of have to deal with their own rules while the Jays did with for two years. But, you know, just on a kind of a side note is that you're seeing teams kind of work around the testing requirements now because of going to Buffalo. I just thought that was kind of interesting when we kind of noticed it a couple of days ago and it kind of became more of a, a new story throughout the last couple of days. All that drama aside, the Blue Jays have yet to lose a series. They are eight and five. Starting pitching is phenomenal right now, and the offense is coming around. By and large, the outlook is good, and they've done all this without Teoscar Hernandez, without Danny Jansen, and without George Springer for one game against the Red Sox. And I know he pinched it, but he was coming off the bench, et cetera, et cetera. They're in a good position right now. They're eight and five. They're cruising right now. They're probably going to take some tough losses against Houston probably going to take some tough losses in the next series against Boston and then the series against Houston and New York after that. But um, I don't know. These games are fun to watch. The Blue Jays are doing well. We don't have much to complain about, even if we can get mad at American media that is not covering this correctly. Anyways, we'll wrap series it up there. predictions, oh. series predictions series for you guys. We haven't really done it this year, so I figured we should yeah. start now. I'll be optimistic. I'll say two of three. I think they lose one of these series in this stretch because okay. it's tough to That's win fair. every series when you're playing Boston, Houston, New York, but I'll say two of three. I'll you know what? I'll, I'll say that too. Like the thing is they have Manoa starting, but they also do have Kikuchi and Stripling who definitely could put up a good outing. I'm not saying that they won't, but when you compare, I think the, the Astros who they have pitching, I think Verlander's pitching tomorrow. So mm-hmm. I think two or three is fair, honestly, even, even if, they don't have like the premier guys in the rotation pitching. I'll be the most pessimistic one. I say they get one out of three, but then next week when they come back, they heat it up. And then I know they play the Red Sox the first game or the first series of the homestand. I think they take care of Boston and then they get the revenge on Houston next week, but I'll save that for next week. But this weekend they lose, but next week they're going to bounce back. Is it too late to change my prediction? I think, I think (laughs) one out of three is more accurate because they are facing some really tough pitching. Justin Verlander in the opener. And then um, they got Urquidy and Luis Garcia that they're facing, both of whom are phenomenal starters. So Bring it um, on. Let's yeah, do it. it'll be tough. It'll be a tough series, but okay. We're looking forward to it. Um, as always, you can support our podcast by finding us on social media. That's at section 138 pod on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can head over to Apple podcast and Spotify to give us a rating or interview, which just helps spread the word about what we're doing. And then if you watch these episodes on YouTube, you can find them wherever you find podcasts. If you listen to them, you can watch them on YouTube. All right. We are looking forward to this series against Houston and Justin Verlander tomorrow night. We'll catch you then. 